Hello and welcome to Wellness Today. I'm Chanel Jones. Today we're celebrating Women on the Move, exploring how women have used movement to empower themselves and their communities over the last 70 years. We'll take a look at how exercise changes throughout a woman's life from puberty to menopause. Plus, we'll learn what surprising item inspired the design of the first sports bra and the best ways to eat before, during, and after a workout. And we'll introduce you to a new fitness platform that's making room for everyone to get moving. This is Women on the Move. Although today it's common to see a woman heading to the gym or out for a jog, it's still a relatively new phenomenon, a movement decades in the making. From jogging and jazzercise to Pilates and HIIT, over the years women have celebrated their bodies through exercise, but it hasn't always been this way. In the 1950s and 1960s, exercise was considered pretty taboo for women. There were fears that it could damage her or actually make her uterus fall out, and sweat was considered taboo and unladylike. Thanks to the work of dozens of fitness visionaries like Bonnie Pruden, Lottie Burke, and Jane Fonda, women were excited to get up and move. Now go on your toe steps. Put your heels up. As fitness for women became more accepted, it also became more expected. There are so many kind of implicit messages being sent to girls and women from a very young age that to be a woman is to be forever working on your body and to view your body as a project. And the community has not always encouraged everybody to participate. Women's fitness has a history of, of catering to mostly white, middle to upper class women. Women. But everyone deserves to have access to the truly beneficial things that, that fitness can do for our, our mental, physical, and emotional health. The lessons learned through exercise empower other areas of women's lives. Strength begets strength. When you feel physically empowered, when you feel good in your own skin, that can translate to how you make your way in the world. Whether you like to run, dance, or stretch in your home, in the park, or at the gym, women have found their favorite ways to break a sweat. I think we're really at the beginning of a moment where we're, we're learning to harness exercise in a way that's truly about feeling good and, and feeling strong. Using exercise to harness our power. I love that. All right, let's talk a little bit. Joining us now is OBGYN, Dr. Camila Phillips, the founder of Cala Women's Health in New York City. And she's here to explain why exercise is so important at different points in a woman's life. Thank you for talking with us today. Thank you for having me. So we know that a woman's uh, you know, body continues to change over time, but we should be exercising all throughout. So let's break it down into puberty, pregnancy, and then menopause. We'll right. start with puberty, if you will. Um, you know, when girls go through puberty, their bodies change. And they've noticed, teachers have noticed, and experts have noticed, that's when a girl almost pulls back sometimes. Before, she's running all over the place, running around the playground, and then she starts to get a little self-conscious. She may not want to exercise. How do we push through that? You know, why, and why is it so important for teenage girls to stay active? Right. Puberty is such an awkward time for so many young people. I remember it myself, just feeling strange in your mm -hmm. own body. So being active is really important in helping them reconnect. And I like to think outside the box with activity. It doesn't have to be running. It can be soccer, basketball, contact sports, really thinking outside for them to help them engage in different parts of their body. It helps them maintain um, a sense of pride and enthusiasm about what wellness and strength can be and that they embody that. And you're a doctor, so if a girl is having cramps, exercise I know can help, right? Right. It's really important to remember that when we work out, your body releases an amazing assortment of endorphins, which are natural pain killers and so before we go to reach for some um, pill mm -hmm. you know sometimes moving your body jogging around the block doing a dance party in your living room can help release those endorphins and help with menstrual pain I love that all right let's talk about pregnancy another big life event if you will 
exercise. I know it certainly depends on the woman, so you definitely need to check with your doctor. One of my pregnancies, I was walking all over the place. My sister's like working out when she's pregnant. My twins, I couldn't even walk, so right. good night, everybody. Right. Uh, but what's the thought when it comes to exercise and pregnancy? Yeah. Well, we've really had a paradigm shift as it relates to being active in pregnancy. So the days of laying on the couch are no more. Mm -hmm. We encourage women who um, are having normal, safe pregnancies to get out there and move your body. It helps reduce the risk of C-section, gestational diabetes and hypertension, and really can help with the marathon of labor. Are there any exercises that you shouldn't do when mm -hmm. you're pregnant? So you really want to use your best judgment. Anything that involves contact is probably sure. not the sure. best idea. Yeah, yeah. So soccer, basketball, those kind of things. You can do a stationary bike because your risk of falling is, is minimal, but you want to use your best judgment. Swimming, low impact exercises are best. Well, what about post-pregnancy? What would you say? Exercise is key post-pregnancy. So when you're active while you're pregnant, it helps your recovery postpartum. Women who have gained the extra weight tend to lose it faster. It helps with your mental health and warding off postpartum depression because you're still staying active and engaging. And also can help with toning your core and getting back to your regular clothes. All right, so now I think I'm in the, what am I, almost 44. There's perimenopause and then mm -hmm. menopause. There's, and it gets harder, right. frankly, to, to, to lose the weight or to try to stay fit but what are your what's your advice once a woman starts to go through menopause like I understand um, you recommend that they start using weights for example I think a lot of women are often very afraid of picking up weight I am sometimes yeah, well, because I'm, I'm for you know you don't want you're worried about bulking, bulking up. up yes <laughs> even a 5 10 15 pound weight is gonna help you maintain your muscle and really tone a lot of women complain of extra unintentional weight gain and that's what weights are gonna help you do also picking up weights are going to maintain your bone health, which is super critical when you're menopausal. Osteopenia, osteoporosis, where the bones weaken and can actually fracture, it's a big deal. And so weight-bearing exercises, including picking up some weights, are going to be great. So have you, obviously you have, and doctors have seen the difference. Is it preventable? So let's say in your family you have a history of either osteoporosis or you see some folks in your family who are dealing with those issues. If you start now, can you perhaps avoid the, what feels like inevitable? You might be able to ward it off, but that is a risk factor, having yeah. a family history of it. And so paying attention to it early, recognizing it early, and intervening with weights is definitely going to do you well. Okay. Such good advice. Thank you so much Thanks. for talking with us today. Thanks for having me. All right. Coming up, now we're inspired. Learn how three friends transformed the way women exercise forever. And later, tips on how to fuel your body before, during, and after that workout that we promised to do. All that and more just ahead on Wellness Today. We are back with Women on the Move. For many women, the idea of doing a workout without a good sports bra seems impossible. But in the late 70s, that wasn't the case until three women came together to invent this groundbreaking essential. The jogging craze of the 70s got Lisa Lindahl up and running. But the new exercise made one thing painfully clear. So were you working out one day in college and you said, you know what, this regular bra just isn't working? I had started running. I loved it. It literally changed my life. And the only uncomfortable part about it was my bouncing boobs, frankly. <laughs> Regular bras just weren't supportive enough for fitness for women with larger chests. So Lisa turned to her childhood friend, Polly Palmer Smith, and her colleague, Hinda Miller, both costume designers, to build a better bra. But they weren't having any luck until Lisa's husband put a jock strap on his chest as a joke. My then husband <laughs> came yeah. down the stairs and said, Hey, ladies, here's your jock bra. We thought that was so funny. and. I, so I took it off of him and pulled it on myself, and I went, Polly, I'm not moving. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Polly took two jock straps and sewed them together, and that design informed the final product, which they called the jog bra. And our goal was to make it a climb-in bra, not no hooks, no straps that would fall off. So that was my mission. While Polly became an Emmy award-winning costume designer, Lisa and Hinda ran the booming jog bra business for more than a decade. It grew because women were demanding 
products that supported them in their new active life. So it was the one-two punch of Title IX and the sports bra that allowed girls and women to really step up and step into their own power. Um, we have the crisscross straps in the back. Now the jog bra resides in the National Museum of American History's collections, in part because of the invention's impact on women. Gave them freedom of movement. It allowed them to, you know, do more vigorous exercise. This opened up a lot of areas for them that they didn't feel comfortable in before. But for the inventors of the first sports bra, it's seeing women succeed in sports and embrace fitness that makes them proud. That was the mission of Jogra. No matter what your size, shape, or age, every woman and girl deserves the benefits of exercise and fitness. I had the best time talking with Lisa, Hinda, and Polly. By the way, they were inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame for creating the jog bra, and you can see it on display at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History starting in 2023. Well deserved. So now that we know how the sports bra was invented, here's the big question for us today. How do we find one that fits? So joining us now is Self Magazine's editor-in-chief, Lita Shy, to share tips on keeping the girls supported. Hi. Hi, Chanel. I just think this is so fantastic. I have to be honest. I was born in 78. You know, the sports bra in my mind has always been. So to right. see these women who actually, you know, started it. Exactly. It's they're, pretty they're cool. They're the reason why we were able to work out with confidence. Exactly. Exactly. Me. All right. So let's talk about why, first of all, it's so important uh, for women to find the right sports bra. Right. So with when it comes to finding the right fit, it's not just about how you feel, but also your confidence level. So I think a really important thing to remember is if we're wearing the right clothes and we're feeling good about what we're, what we're working out in, we're gonna have a good workout. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. But also, if you have the wrong fitting bra, it can lead to things like breast pain, which is just not good for anyone, but that can you know, lead to kind of some long-term issues. Yeah, you can be fitness, sore. You can be sore yeah. during your workouts. Um, if it is okay. really important. So on that note, we have three different mannequins here yes. with some different um, you know, things to think about when you're purchasing a sports bra. So with this one, pretty basic, but what do we need to know? So this one, you know, when you're when you're really looking for a sports bra, it's it's important to one be able to try it out in, in the dressing room if you can. But if you're shopping online, really look for the three types of supports: so okay. low impact, medium impact, and high impact. And this is a good example of a low impact bra. So you know, it, it's got. Um, some straps right here. It's got um, just like, you know, it's keeping you supported, but it's, but not, it's not more like, you know, it's not, it's like not locked in. in. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're a little heavier chested, you need a little bit more support. Yeah. I didn't realize you could buy one that looks almost like a bra. Yeah. So this is called an encapsulated bra. Um, there's different versus a, a more compression bra yeah. or like, so we don't have one here, but you know, kind of what we would think of the uniboob mm -hmm, look. Mm -hmm. This one is if you, if you like to kind of keep your cup separate, um, it's got some styles in the back where you can, you can make it into a racer back, but style is really important when you are searching for a bra because there are so many different types out there mm -hmm. that it's, um, you know, it can be hard to find the right fit for you. Okay. And I think what's important about shopping for a bra is to always put it on, try it, see how it feels, where does it fit on your rib cage? Is it hard to breathe? Is it easy to breathe? Is it too constricting? All of those things are really important. I put on and I just jump. Yeah, you and I see, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I see how it goes. Exactly. All right, so last but not least, uh, full disclosure, I told her, I'm like, <laughs> do I want a corset vibe? I but know, you brought up a really good point, though. Sometimes vibes going on, right? Yes, <laughs> but sometimes they're hard to get off. So yeah. this takes that away. Exactly. So um, a lot of people, you know, after a workout, you're really sweaty. You don't actually, you know, the, the idea of just going like this is, is not so great. So a lot of people really like front front zippers, sure. front clasps, some back clasps. This is a good example of that. And this one is actually really great for people with larger chests. It's a high impact bra. It keeps everything in. You can jump around. You can do a lot of movement. And yeah, like as it goes all the way up. up. Exactly. You're, you're in there. The girls are in there. Yep. Really quickly, how often should you replace it and, and washing with some of your sports bras? You know what? I'm I, I, I'm I'm not sure how much you how many you should wash it. Probably yeah. every single time you you wear it. But as far um, as the care, hand wash, probably hand wash. Yeah. Put it in a garment bag. Yeah, yeah. Um, as long as you are feeling comfortable in your bra, there's no breast pain. I okay. think you can you can you can keep your bra as long as. As you, as you like it. Okay. Lita, thank you. Good things to keep in mind. All right. Coming up, a registered dietitian breaks down what you should eat to fuel your best workout. And later, a new kind of movement platform that inspires so much more than just a good sweat. Right after this.
Welcome back to Wellness Today, Women on the Move. Here to teach us a few ways we can use food as our fuel to add a boost to our workouts is registered dietitian Vanessa Rosetto. Thank you for stopping by. Yeah, thanks for having me. So excited. So let's dig in a little bit. First of all, let's talk about three factors that we should all consider when we're planning our meals during the day. Yeah, so three factors we want to consider are the duration, the intensity, and the time of day. Okay. So if you're going to exercise at five o'clock in the morning, a lot of people don't really feel very great eating right away, yeah, right? Absolutely. It's like, it's hard, right? Because if you're getting up at five, yeah. you're probably gonna work out at like 5.15. So you wanna think about what did you eat the night before? If you're properly fueled from the night before, then you should be fine to sustain your workout. And then after you eat, you probably wanna wait about 20 minutes and you should just have a regular breakfast, protein, fat, carbohydrate. Okay. So if we look over here, we okay. can see, right? We have a slice of toast. There's that's a carb. We so this right here would be before a workout. One or the other? You could have after the workout, and you could also probably have before if okay. you cho so choose. But I would suggest waiting 30 to 60 minutes okay. just because it might not make your stomach feel really great. Okay. So you want to pay attention to that. Okay. But you could have this slice of toast, peanut butter, you've got protein, you have fat, you have carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. You could also have oatmeal. It has exact, the exact same thing. You just want to think if you want to have that extra protein in the oatmeal and you're making the, pro the oatmeal with water, then you would add a peanut butter or maybe protein. So it seems like you need the carbs, protein, and a little bit of fat. Totally. You need it all. Yes. And I think in our minds, a lot of us think, okay, no fat right. or no carbs. Right. You know, we constantly try to figure it out. Right. But if we had them all together, it helps to slow down that digestion and helps keep you full until the next meal. Okay. So you're not constantly looking for the next meal okay. because you're properly fueled. And then 30 to 60 minutes, would you say, before you work out? Yeah, because, you know, moving around, jumping around, yeah, it's a lot. it might make you not feel well. If you're somebody who you're not affected, by all okay. means, have at it, but okay. it just depends on who you are. So let's talk about staying hydrated doing, during a workout. Is just good old-fashioned water not enough, or do you need a little extra oomph? Well, it just depends, right? If I'm training for the New York City Marathon in August, right. New York City in August is very warm, right? Yeah. So I would need more than just water. But what about just the average Joe watching this morning? Or I'm, not Joe. Or, well, you can be a Joe, too. Yeah. Or Julia. So <laughs> how, how hydrated are you? Are okay. you somebody who drinks alcohol at night? Mm -hmm. You might be more dehydrated. Do you did you have coffee? So you want to be paying attention to that. What so, are these things? Right. So we've got water here is fine. Yeah. These. You could also have powdered electrolyte water or just a noon tablet. Okay. And What's also, that? I don't even know what that is. A noon tablet is, again is electrolyte. So okay. it's just going to help you stay more hydrated. Okay. And if you don't want to spend money or have these things in your house, good old fashioned table salt will do the same trick. Really? Yes. What, in your water? Yeah, in your water. Just a little bit? Just a little bit, just a pinch. It's gonna help you with hydration. It's gonna help your muscles. So you don't have to go through this exercise of spending extra cash yeah. on, on, a, on electrolyte water. Learn something every day. Yeah. All right, let's talk about after your workout. I asked her, full disclosure, if it's true after you work out, if you eat a meal, like your body's like burning it. <laughs> and she said, no, that's not true. <laughs> so talk about what we should eat after a workout. Yeah, so like, okay, here's the thing. When you exercise, your muscles are depleted of glycogen, which is their energy store. So you want to make sure that you definitely have eaten something so that you're not using all the, the muscles that you've been building. So that makes sense. But how are ways for you to replenish and recover? So we have blueberries here. That's like the best recovery. Um, and also- Why you, is that? It's just because the um, antioxidants help with the muscles. Okay. So muscle, you know, runners do sure. this, cyclists. And then you want to add some cheese to it because there's protein there. So it's going to help spare your muscles. And and then also a really good recovery drink, the best recovery drink is chocolate milk. It has electrolytes, it has calcium, it has magnesium, it has phosphorus. So again, it helps with your hydration, it helps keep your muscles boosted, and also it's gonna help you feel full. You know what, it's so funny because we've been trained, and it's not right, but to think chocolate milk or cheese, like some of these things are bad, but it just goes to show. Yeah, no, we don't have to omit any food and yeah. we don't need to vilify these yeah. foods. If yeah. they work for you, you should definitely have them. And it also makes things like different and exciting. So think about if you had worked out maybe in the middle of the day and it's, you know, not quite ready for lunch, you can have a chocolate milk as a snack and that's yeah. going to feel good. And you're not going to feel so hungry and yeah. peckish maybe later on at night. What's your thought on counting calories or calories in versus calories out? Not all calories are created equal. Sure. If you want to think about 96 calories of beer versus 96 calories of chicken are going to be digested entirely different way. Okay. So calories in, calories out is very like old, but 
nutrition is a new science. We yeah. only started studying it maybe like 80 years ago. Yeah. So we're still always learning. And that was something that we thought was true, you know, in the mid 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. 70s. But now we know that's not entirely the story. Mm -hmm. So I don't think counting calories is the way, but really making sure that you have protein, fat, and carb at every meal is going to help you stay full. And then you don't have to be so hyper focused on the calorie. But what does the makeup of the plate look like? Mm -hmm. Do you have fiber? Do you have fat? Are you enjoying your food? Mm -hmm. Those are things that are going to help you in the long run, not overeat or binge later on in the day. It almost too sounds like it looked this whole show is about health and wellness. Just being mindful yeah. of what you're putting in, even yeah. with these things, like even before you work out, like all of these things, it's well thought out, but you see all of the groups here. Totally. And also yeah. like what's right for you is not right for me. Yeah. There's so many factors. Vanessa Rosetto, thank you thank so you. much. All right, when we come back, actor Allison Stoner's new fitness platform that will inspire all of us to get moving right here on Wellness Today. Welcome back to Women on the Move. You may recognize Allison Stoner from her roles in Step Up and Cheaper by the Dozen. Now her latest project with her sister, Corey O'Neill, is disrupting the wellness space with movement classes to help improve not only physical health, but emotional and mental well-being too. I got a chance to sit down with them to learn more about Movement Genius and an inclusive and empowering platform. Take a look. And starting with your feet, go ahead and tighten the muscles in your feet by curling your toes downward. And now exhale and suddenly release all the tension completely. So we are currently at the annual Youth Wellness Summit with the Society for the Prevention of Teen Suicide. And Movement Genius is teaching students some different stress relief techniques that they can use to support their mental health. We first built Movement Genius thinking this would be for young people but really this is for everyone with a body. Historically, wellness has been built by and for a very narrow set of bodies. So right off the bat, we wanted to make sure that we're collaborating with practitioners and experts who embody all lived experiences, all kinds of body types, preferences, needs, so that you can see wellness for everyone. Just like your mind, your body is remembering all of your experiences every day. The high moments, the low moments. It's interesting though, because when I think about mental health, I don't know if I connect it with the body, you think neck up. Where is stress, anxiety, and even trauma stored? In the body, in the muscles, in your cells, in these learned behaviors and responses to different situations. So mindful movement allows you to reconnect your mind and body, learn how your body needs to relax and release tension. This isn't a new practice per se, but it's never been presented in an entertaining format. If you're releasing a bunch of stress hormones and adrenaline, shaking it out actually helps you release that adrenaline and then you can come down to a state of calmness. So you've heard of fight, flight, or freeze? Absolutely. Or stress and threat response. Now, what happens after that threat is done? What do you normally do? I don't really run. Maybe I freeze? I don't know. So once we freeze, have you ever seen an animal in a moment of threat do you recognize what they do after that threat has no, passed? No, I've never really thought about it. After a moment of threat, we'll kind of just shake it off and then keep moving forward and shake out shake some of the stress. So it's not just fun, it actually, there's science it behind works. it. There is science behind it. We're just reminding you of the intelligence that your body has to cope with stress and feel better. You'll see me doing this tomorrow before yes. the show and you're like, what is she doing? Exactly. <laughs> Movement Genius is committed to making their wellness classes accessible to everybody. Most memberships cost no more than $10 a month. Thank you for joining me to celebrate how women have transformed their lives through exercise. We've seen how breaking a sweat is essential for our mental, physical, and emotional well-being at all stages of our lives. I am feeling ready, and I hope you are too, to find the fitness routine that makes you feel your best every single day. I'm Chanel Jones, and we'll see you next time on Wellness Today. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Find your favorite recipes, celebrity interviews, uplifting stories, shop our favorite deals, and so much more with the Today app. Download it now.